Welcome back. Tom Harbin here with you. Hey, have you ever thought about running for office? Have you ever just engaged in political debates with people? Uh, you know, have, have you, uh, you know, tried to change people's minds, tried to influence people? There's a guy who's an expert on this kind of stuff, and I want to have a, do a deep dive with him into this and also invite you into this. If you, if you would like to know or learn how to become a better communicator, how to, how to, uh, how to be more convincing in your presentations, how to, how to influence uh, people's political opinions. Uh, you know, as I said, particularly if you want to run for office, because that's specifically uh, what Robert, Roger Wolfson does. He's the formal, former uh, counsel to uh, Senators Lieberman, Kerry, Wellstone, and Ted Kennedy. Uh, he then left that work and became a TV and screenwriter. He's written for Law & Order, SVU, Saving Grace, uh, the Closer, and many other television programs. He's a founder of this new group called the Writers Action Group, which teaches storytelling skills to uh, basically every level of the Democratic Party. The website is writersaction.com, and uh, Roger Wolfson is with us. His, uh, his Twitter handle, by the way, Roger, writersaction.com, his Twitter handle is Roger underscore Wolfson, W-O-L-F-S-O-N. Roger, welcome back to the program. So good to, so good to be back, Tom. Great Thanks. Thanks. So, so uh, you know, I'm inviting people to call if they have questions about how to be a more effective communicator. And I notice a lot of lines are ringing. I don't know if it's, uh, you know, specifically those kind of questions. But I want to I get into this with you for a while here. Give us the, the main premise and tell us what you're up to. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, the main pre uh, premise is that we have noticed, and I'm sure you've noticed, <laughs> that Democrats sometimes have a hard time speaking from the heart. Uh, to me, it's because Republicans during the era of Reagan and from then on uh, have ceded the rational high ground. Um, I personally, I, I say this is a proud progressive. I don't think that the Republicans, that their policies really make much sense. I think that they serve the short-term interests of the rich, and that's about it. And I don't think that that's really effective, and yet they have to persuade a lot of people to vote for them anyway. So they have to persuade a lot of people to vote against their best interests. In order to persuade people to do that, the Republicans, since I believe they have a hard time arguing the facts, Republicans have learned how to argue their emotions. They've learned how to just pick up their shoe and pound it on the, on the podium. Uh, and as a result, they come off as strong and passionate and committed, while Democrats are left feeling like, well, what's going on here? We have the right argument. We have the right facts. We have the right statistics. And Democrats are left arguing from a left brain place where they're trying to persuade people that they're right. So it's almost like in the 1980s uh, during the Reagan administration when the Republican Party was almost entirely captured by the billionaire class. And now I'd say it's an, it is entirely captured. That you know, their policies moved from the Eisenhower policies of the 50s, uh, you know, where Dwight Eisenhower was openly, I mean, he ran for re-election in 1956 on, on literally on the fact that he had added um, more than a million people to, to unionized labor roles and more than two million people to Social Security, right? The, the Republicans moved from that to basically a, a whole large set of lies, you know, that small government is a good thing, when really what they were talking about was... aircraft controllers. <laughs> right, right. Reducing yeah. the administrative, yeah. you know, reducing oversight of corporations, cutting taxes, are going, you know, raising ta uh, cutting taxes is going to bring more revenue in, you know. All these fundamental lies, and the only way that they could sell these lies was to do it with emotion. And so they got really, really good at that. Uh, you know, probably the peak of that was Willie Horton, you know, selling, sell I mean, just the whole I mean, Dukakis, you know, would you, what, what would you do if somebody killed your wife? I mean, that, you know, it, it was just, this is really where this all came from. And the Democrats have been just saying all along for the last 40 years, well, you know, all those Republicans are lying to you and their policies are wrong. And we're here for you on unemployment insurance. We're here for you on Social Security. We're here for you on Medicare, this, that, and, and that doesn't work, is yeah, essentially what you're saying. It doesn't work. And, and, and in fact, it makes it even worse, because by imprisoning Democrats in their left brain, they, where they're arguing statistics and facts and points and trying to prove how right they are, Democrats come off as school marmish. They come off as impassionate, not passionate. 
and they come off as inauthentic. That's the word we hear so often when it comes to politicians, particularly particularly um, in the Democratic Party. They don't come off as speaking from the heart. Right. And so what, you know, my background, you know, I used to work for Paul Wellstone and Ted Kennedy, and it was one of the, you know, it was the, one of the greatest periods of my life. These were the stalwart liberals of, the, of their day, um, if not every day. And when Paul Wellstone died, and I really felt like I, I couldn't work for anybody else, I became a television writer, and I kind of buried myself in Hollywood and in writing because I, I couldn't face politics. And in the process, I learned how to connect to large audiences. The first episode of television that I wrote starred Viola Davis, and it reached an audience of 9 million people which is many, many, many times more people than ev- if you added up all the speeches I ever wrote, even for Ted Kennedy, they didn't reach 9 million people. And then I, that TV series was called Century City, and it was canceled. Uh, and my next show was Law & Order SVU. So I went from an, sort of an aspirational show, Century City, which was about life uh, in the near future, to a show about the nitty-gritty, harsh, dramatic tales of, sex and violence Mm -hmm. and and i'm not telling you that i enjoyed writing for that it wasn't natural to me um but i will tell you that i learned how to connect to people i learned what drives people in the first episode of television that i wrote for law and order sdu i think reached about 18 million people and then i learned from that show and from subsequent shows like the closer and saving grace and fairly legal i learned how hard it is to keep an audience and how you have to grab them. You have to grab their attention. And you don't grab them necessarily just with fear or sex, which are the ways that a lot of people go. You grab people with any profound emotion, any emotion. You grab them with, um, with hurt. You grab them with heartbreak. You grab them with genuine humor. Trump grab is grabbing them. people with hate right now, is he not? Well, and I think that that's, that is the reflex for a lot of politicians when they don't have an emotional range. Now, you look at, at uh, Ronald Reagan, better or worse, this is a man who knew how to, who knew how to connect on many different levels. Oh, because he, he was, was an actor. Even though he was, he was an actor, he also read his lines, and he had, terrific, he had Peggy Noonan. He had really great people behind him telling him what to say. Right. But he also knew, he knew how to be aspirational as well as fear-mongering. He also knew how to be funny. He, he, had, he had a wide palette with which to paint. Donald Trump has just about one or two things he can do. He does them supremely well. And one of the reasons he does them so well, Tom, is because of my industry. You know, we created The Apprentice. We built him into this mythological figure who goes down staircases and tells people that they're fired. We built him into that, and he followed along. He has, I think, right. stayed on just one track. Right. Um, yeah. And frankly, if he could read a script, he, he would be, you know, shockingly effective. Yeah, this is this is remarkable stuff. We're talking with Roger Wolfson. He's put together this group, uh, the the Writers Action, uh, WritersAction.com, the Writers Action Network, and uh, they're they're basically teaching people how to be more effective communicators. And and by the way, it's Martin Luther King Day. We just did a whole hour on the assassination of Martin Luther King, and uh, and and this is such a timely moment because now we've got at least in the Democratic Party, you know, one of the most diverse fields ever. Um, lots and lots of people, you know, v- showed up and voted last year. I mean, you know, people are waking up. So if you have a question for Roger, and I see uh, uh, Charles in Southgate, California. Uh, uh, do you have a question for Roger about this, about communic- how to communicate effectively? Yeah, Dave. Charles, you're on the air. Well, I tell the people all the time, you know, and they tell me, well, uh, you know, don't talk to me about politics. But I really believe that, like, politics is, like, the main thing that can change our society. Mm-hmm. I'd like you to do it on a grass level. But I live in a Latino community, and I would, I would need some help. But anyway, what's the most effective way to, like, communicate to people that you're interested in them and their community, and their life. Roger, we got two minutes to the break. Okay, well, that's a, that is the ultimate question. Is it, is it Carl? Charles. Your name? Charles. Um, I'm sorry, I might have been thinking about your father, Tom. <laughs> um, so Charles, 
I think that the most effective way to communicate that you really care about a community is to start by explaining your connection to them um, or what it, what it is about the community that you do not belong to, assuming you don't belong to I'm assuming that you're not um, Latino um, or Hispanic, but if you're not, then what is it about their lives that connects to your life? What are the emotions that you experience when you see them? What, how, how can you relate it to your own experience? It's, and this is important, Charles. It's not enough to just say, you know, I met this person on the street and they were, um, you know, th they were suffering from discrimination in their high school and I felt bad. You know, it, that just sucks. You know, you, you can't just talk about them and their experience. You have to be able to connect it to your own. So you talk about somebody in that community um, who you have connected to on some level, and then you explain how that relates to your own life and to individual experiences in your own life. Does that make sense, Charles? Well, it's not that much different from mine. It's just, you know, a different culture. Okay. And so we only have, I think, a minute. C can you tell me why you feel connected to the Latina, uh, to the Hispanic community? Well, because I've been here for 20 years, and I see people on the street who have no jobs, you know, unless they join the Army or something. So that's your okay. that's that's your connection is you live you live with these folks. And in addition, I think what you're saying is that you see them not being able to get jobs. So was there a time in your life, Charles, when you were not unable to get a job? Of course. Yeah. OK. So I think we found a, a point of intersection. That would be a stepping off point. Charles, thank you for the call. Um, Sorry about the breaks, but <laughs> we have no, no choice. Roger Wilson <laughs> is uh, advising us all on how to be more effective communicators, whether you're canvassing, whether you're running for office, whether you're just talking to crazy Uncle Ralph over Thanksgiving dinner. It's 18 minutes past the hour. Chris in Ridgecrest, California, you are on the air with, with uh, Roger Wilson. Hi, Tom, and hi, hi Roger. Uh, Roger, I just saw a video last week on YouTube by Chris Voss. He was the FBI lead hostage negotiator, and he said uh, he talked about a technique that he does when he's dealing with hostage negotiations that struck me as what the Republicans do and why they're so good at holding on to people. And it's similar to what you're saying. He says he doesn't try to get a yes out of them. He tries to get a no out of them. He tries to make them have questions where they answer no because the brain chemistry or something, when you say no, it puts you in a, a sense of security. And I'm wondering if maybe that's what's going on with a lot of Republicans. He used one of Reagan's questions as an example. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? Of course, a lot of people are going to say no. And it kind of locks them into this false sense of security. I was wondering if you had any comment on that or it's kind of well, complicated. I'm sorry. I threw a lot out there. That's a good one. No, it's totally, totally fine, Chris. And I think that Tom certainly understands uh, what I'm about to say, which is that I think that Republicans have profited from making us all discouraged about government itself. Uh, the more people are discouraged about government itself, the more it looks like a dirty business, the more mm -hmm. infighting there is between the parties the less people want to be engaged in politics and the fewer people vote. And the fewer people vote, the more Republicans win elections. So that is definitely, I think, the Republican grand strategy, to make us all feel negative. That word that you're using, that word no, it's very easy to go to a negative place. And, Tom, you're also aware of the idea of negative emphasis, right, which is the well, key yeah, I was designed. Mm. I mean, right. there, there's the, you know, uh, George Lakoff uh, uh, popularized this with the title of his book, Don't Think About an Elephant. As soon as you ask somebody a question to which the answer is no, they have to evoke the answer of yes in their brain first to look at it and say, no, that's not what it is. You know, you point at a dog and say, is that an elephant and or, you know, whatever. And they, they would have to imagine an elephant to say, no, that's not an elephant. Exactly. So, I mean, there are there's a lot of mental games being played here. And I'm not, you know, what, what I just believe is I think that we need to have two parties. You know, we have to have both parties. If the Republicans are going to do that, I'm not saying that Democrats have to stoop to any kind of a level 
or that, that I never would think that Democrats should propagandize or manipulate. But I think that, they, that there are certain skills that Democrats need to learn so that they have these tools in the shed so that they can be effective. It's simple as that. And I think that what you're talking about in terms of negative emphasis and in terms of making people think of something, that's a, that's a tool to have. As long as you're honest about it, as long as you're open about what you're doing, as long as you're effective in what you're doing, I think that's a, it's a skill worth teaching. Could you... Also, go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a writer, too, um, or I'm trying to be. Uh, how, how can I get involved more with your organization? Just go to your website or... I'd like to start yeah, something sure. local. Or... Okay. Yeah, writers act, writersaction dot com, and we're, we're we're very focused on being a national organization because at the, our hope is that we can help every single Democrat who's running in for any level office in the country, so that they can be as effective as they possibly can. So, so Roger, have you thought about setting up local chapters all over the country? I, I think that is definitely going to happen. Sounds like Chris is uh, one of your guys. Chris, thanks for the call. Oh, thank you, Chris. We'll be right back with Roger Wolfson. Stick around. Uh, about how, how do we most successfully communicate political messages? How can we individually do this? Tanya in LaGrange Park, Illinois. You're on the air with Roger. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. You can speak up a little okay, bit. Cool. Yes. Okay, um, my daughters and I are driving back to the Chicago suburbs from D.C. from the Women's March, so we are in Pennsylvania right now, so Great. sorry, I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, I volunteer for Common Sense Gun Laws, and I want to know how I can reach out to Republican women to help with this fight because the majority of Republican voters also do agree that common sense gun laws are needed, but they are not getting vocal. They're not letting their representatives know how they feel. So how can I ask them to help with this fight? Well, that's a great question, Tanya, and I'm glad that that's an issue that you care about because it's one that I care about as well. So I would start with this. What about your experience? What's unique about your experience that you think that a Republican woman might, in, might be impacted? Um, I guess maybe meeting the families who have been affected, whose loved ones have been killed, and the horrible I'm statistics. About you, I'm talking about you specifically, Tanya. You're in a car right now with your daughter, right? Yes. Okay, I want to know about you, Tanya. What, like, why is this issue, why is this issue important to you personally? Um, basically, having two daughters, um, the Sandy Hook shooting is the one that did it for me. I want my children to be safe wherever they go. Okay, and can you tell me, uh, can you give me a little bit more information about that? Okay, when you talk about you having your daughter being safe. Um, what is, what is, okay, what is your biggest fear? What is my biggest fear? Um, basically any public place that my daughters go to that something can happen. Um, schools, movie theaters, at friends' houses, malls. Okay, and have you I mean, had, what, has there ever been an experience, has there ever been a time when you couldn't reach your daughter and there was something going on and that made, that made you scared. I'm sorry, we're hitting, a, we're hitting a hard break here. I've got to, I've got to wrap this up, but it sounds, Roger, like you're trying to get Tanya to come up with a specific story. I was, I was here and this is what happened and this is what, you know, this is when I got scared, that kind of thing. Is that, is that right? Yeah. I'm yeah, okay. To well, let's talk about it on the other side of the break. Tanya, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you so much for the call. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 202-808-9925. Roger, we've got calls from Minnesota to Texas for you. We're talking to Roger Wolfson, uh, the former counsel to Senators Wellstone and, Cal and Kennedy, writersaction.com. Welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you. Roger Wolfson is on the line with us. He has started this group, writersaction.com, uh, to, uh, to help teach people how to be effective communicators around issues of politics. And Roger, before we pick up another call for you, um, you want to just kind of 
summarize what where you were trying to get with uh, the woman who had called just before the break? Yeah, so the woman, Tanya, who called, she was speaking about gun violence, and she wanted to be able to connect to Republican women on this subject. Uh, and what my basic point to her was, in order to be most effective in connecting to somebody else, you need to understand why you care about the issue yourself. And you need to have an emotional reaction in your own words and in your own stories. So what I was trying to get to was, why do you care about this issue so much? Where does the fear lie, or where does the care lie, or where is the deep rooted passion where does that come from and then i think that if she can connect to that then she can portray that to others she can bring people along for her emotional journey they can feel attached to her and they can feel driven by her cause on the same level that she is great we have another 10 minutes uh, that, that will continue with us then we've got uh, talk media news at 45 so uh, let's uh, let's move along here bill in st paul minnesota listening on am 910 bill you're on the air with roger wolfson Hi, Roger and Tom. Uh, I have a question about a phrase I heard some years ago. Don't I don't hear it too much anymore. That's the dumbing down of Americans. Is, number one, is that true? Is it true now? And uh, if it applies, how does it apply, apply to working and middle class Trump supporters? Uh, thank you. I'll take my answer off the air. Bye bye. Thank you, Bill. All right. Thank you, Bill. Well, personally, I think that the more appropriate quote comes from Senator Patrick Moynihan, who said that society continues to define deviancy down. Uh, I, I don't think that we're getting necessarily dumber. I think that on some aspects we're getting smarter and in other areas we're getting more progressive. I think we're, that, that society is branching off in a lot of different directions at the same time. What I do feel the concern is, is that over time we're becoming more complacent, more discouraged, and less likely to be engaged in issues. So, and, 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 and we, we start becoming accepting of worse and worse behavior from our politicians, from our political systems, from our news media. And that, to me, is what's, what's of greatest concern. Valerie in Dallas, Texas, you're on the air with Roger Wilson. Hi. I'm in a, I'm in a park. Sorry, Val Valerie, you just faded out there. You still with us? Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Go for it. Okay. Um, I have a neighbor who's so racist. She actually said um, that... Be careful what you repeat what? on the air, please, Valerie. Well, <laughs> it's really frightening. I live in Texas. You can... Let me just imagine something like from the history and the KKK. And okay. I, I honestly don't know how to talk to her. I actually became so infuriated that I, well, I found myself going crazy. All right, Valerie, let me ask you a question. Are you by are you a Christian? Um, I am. Uh, I do not uh, adhere to any denomination. Okay, that's I, I just asked you because of the regionality and it, it, there is a high percentage, and because I'm going to quote G, uh, Jesus here. It's the idea of. Loving the, sin, loving the sinner and hating the sin. Um, when you communicate to somebody, and also I think we can quote Martin Luther King Jr. here, especially today, which is that you know, people can feel your underlying disgust. And I'm, I know I'm not getting the quote quite right. Uh, but when you communicate to somebody about how you feel, how their words made you feel, the key is not to be condemning them in your mind or your heart or your words while saying it. If you can distance your emotional experience from your judgment of them, then they have the possibility of hearing you. So it's called, and, and you can look up more of this, it's called nonviolent communication. But the basic key of it is what you tell this person, let me just explain to you without condemning you because I understand, the, I, know, I know you to be a good person. I know, that, I, I know where your heart really most likely lies, but let me tell you how what you said made me feel. And then just be honest about it. It made you feel violated. It made you feel um, angry. It made you feel hurt. It made you feel wounded. And, and tell us now, that way, how did the, that person's words make you feel? Um, extremely shocked. Shock. Extremely shocked shock okay. that I could actually think way in this day and age. Valerie, your phone is breaking up. I'm sorry. 
Uh, in fact, it looks like it broke up altogether. Okay, Roger, we got. We, I, I think we got it there. Let's let's move along. Sarah in Fort Worth, Texas. Hey, Sarah, you are on the air uh, with Roger Wilson. Hi. Uh, yes, uh, actually, my husband. When we talk, and I'm surrounded by my whole family, they're Trump supporters, and just as the last caller, you know, this is Texas. Um, but I get so emotional, and I try to express real facts and um he he tells me that i get so emotional <laughs> that i lose everybody around me um that, that yeah. they, they don't yeah. they don't want to hear well sarah your, your story is is shared by so many of us including myself uh there are times when people who support trump say things or do things like i was at the women's march a couple of days ago and a group of men mm -hmm. playing music blaring on a on a sound box uh, came scoring down with a maga sign and it was so offensive and were, you could see everybody around them just feeling violated by it but to condemn that person to respond in kind actually wouldn't really be impactful what is yeah. impactful sarah is for you to really be able to tell a story about why this matters to you and again, without condemning your family or your friends in Fort Worth, if you can really communicate to them, look, let me just tell you a story. This is why, um, this is why when, 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 when the President of the United States says that he wants to grab women by their personal parts and he does it freely, let me tell you how that feels to me. You know, I feel yeah. violated. It reminds me of things that have happened in my life. Because when you stay in your personal stories and you just talk about what has happened to you, Sarah, you are unimpeachable. Mm -hmm. There's nothing. So, no one has to argue a fact against that. Well, you're wrong. They can't argue that you're wrong to feel the way you felt. You got also well, the other a thing. Political statement. The, the other Go thing ahead. he says I'm I'm long winded, and I I he says you know when I tell that story or when I tell what's going on with me, he's like Sarah, you're you're going on and on and on, and and they don't want to hear it. Uh, Sarah, this is, you're, you're a perfect caller in the sense that you let me make a lot of really good points that I think everyone needs to hear. Yes, when we tell our stories, we also have to learn to do them with brevity. Because very mm -hmm. often we're repeating the story when it becomes very long or when it becomes very intense. What we're doing on an emotional level is we're actually now dumping on the people around us, and we're belaboring a point. We are so much more powerful. For example, I don't know if you've been listening to this whole call, but sometimes... I've used ums and I've spoken quickly. That's not really effective speaking on my own behalf. When I slow down and I allow there to be a pause, do you see how much easier it is to listen to me? When my voice goes down, when I'm calmer, and when I'm to the point directly, that's another form of unimpeachability. Now it is very hard to pick on what I'm saying. It's very hard to attack what I'm saying because it's easier to hear me. Does that make sense, Sarah? It does, absolutely. Thank you so much for everything you do, and also, Tom, you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Uh, good to hear from you, let's, Sarah. Let's see here. Um, Eric, in, uh, Eric, I don't, have, I don't have a city for you. I'm sorry. Where are you calling from? Yeah, I'm calling from Danville, Virginia. Okay, um, you're on the air. Yeah, I'm calling as a first-time candidate. I'm running for the House of Delegates in Virginia in the 14th District. And this is the area to where um, it's a Democratic city in a presidential election, but in the, in the congressional and state races, Democrats don't show up to vote. Um, and there are a lot of Democrats that do vote here, the number Republicans, but they just decide to stay home from one election right. to the next. Er Eric so, and, and Roger, yeah. we have a minute and a half until we're going to hit a hard break. So, Yeah, so how can I motivate uh, people that don't go in every election to come out and vote? All right, talk about what motivates you. Simple as that. Talk about why you show up to vote. Talk about why you felt compelled to run. You don't have to tell anybody else, hey, you have to be involved or you have to vote or you have to donate. Don't tell anybody anything. Just if you describe, Eric, why this matters to you, why you're giving up time with your family and why you're taking time off from your job and why you're taking time off from the other things you can do in your life, why does this matter to you? If you center yourself in that, people will follow. They'll connect to it, and they'll feel more motivated and inspired. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's definitely something I'll do. Great. 
Thank you, Eric. Thank you for the call. Um, and Tom, I want to commend you because so many of your callers are coming from these red states. And I really I'm inspired by what you're doing because it really feels like you are providing solace, communication, support and skills to people, to progressives in areas where we need them the most. And I and, and just, just the range of the, where your callers are coming from and their backgrounds is obvious. And it really says a lot about what you're up to, Tom. Yeah, well, thank you, Roger. Um, and, you know, <laughs> we try our best here. Uh, we are going to hit a break, though, in about three seconds. So uh, Roger Wolfson, his uh, Twitter handle is Roger underscore Wolfson, W-O-L-F-S-O-N. The website is writersaction.com.